And now, the Right Honourable Winston Peters. Uh, thank you very much, Tracy. Thanks for coming out this evening. And uh, I suppose the first thing that you need to know is, unlike the rest of the political parties, we're interested in what you think. So there's going to be a serious question time, and you'll have plenty of time to get ready. And at least about 10 people have some relativity to the conversation tonight. You know what's wrong with most politicians? They can't help but talk about themselves. In fact, I know one in Parliament, after about two hours boring this woman, he said, but enough of me, what do you think of me? <laughs> the question I suppose you're asking yourself uh, also is, uh, does politics really matter? Well, there's some bad news for you all. Every minute, every hour, every day, every week, every year, 24-7, politics is controlling you. So could we humbly suggest that maybe you take a serious interest in who's going to have that sort of control over your lives. There are all sorts of parties in Parliament today, a serious ensemble going all the way back to 1893. Then you've got the new age uh, ones that have come out of nowhere. Last five minutes, uh, a bit like a uh, you know, flower in uh, some desert place where the rains come for the first time in five years. They bloom and blush and die unseen and are gone. But temporarily, they sometimes persuade some of you who haven't got experience that they might be a good idea. My party is called New Zealand First. What we stand for is in our name. Not New Zealand being second, third, fourth, fifth, or at the very bottom of the OECD on so many things, but up front, up top, like we used to be, when we, with a small population, are 10 million, uh, 10,000 miles away from our market, a country the size of the UK with a population the size of Manchester put ourselves in the number two or three in every bracket in the world. That's what we used to do until in 1984 there was this neoliberal experiment launched by the Labour Party of all parties when they threw out everything of experience that we once knew and headed down this brave new world which no other country in any time in history has ever done before and you are here, you're here today paying for the consequences. And they've got a thousand reasons why you should pay. These same people, of course, went to university when you had to pay so much, that's true, but you could get six jobs in one day, depending where you were. We had full employment. In fact, the Minister of Labour back then, not because he had an elephantine memory, used to know the name of every registered unemployed person because there were not even 29,000 or 2,900, just 29. And when you hear these modern politicians, they're a great way of excusing the experiment that they all signed up to. Present company accepted, I might have you. Just in case you think, this guy's been around a long time, been making out power stations. But they all signed up to it, First Labour and then National. And if you push them hard, They've got a thousand excuses why you should wait a bit longer before you get the game. Back in 84, the Labour Party said, 84, 85, 86, you're going to have three years of pain, and then you're going to have three years of gain. Well, it's 2017. That's one hell of a long time to wait for some gain. And you'll still hear them saying the same thing, because it's Tweedledum and Tweedledee, or flip and flop, with every way you like to look at it, but they'll keep on telling you why you have to go for through more arduous times, more difficult times, because somehow if you do that, then the economy will come right. Ladies and gentlemen, it won't. And it's not. And although we've grown our population massively in our terms to 4.7 million and rushing to 5 million, and whilst the GDP has gone up, the earnings per person against GDP a GDP are going down. It's not very difficult. Most average people out in the countryside, no matter where they are in the hamlets of this country, can tell you that if you've got three kids and you make and you have three more and your income doesn't go up, then everybody in the household is going to be worse off. It ain't complicated apart from when you go to oh, the universities of this country and start following the Chicago School of Economics and all of a sudden are seduced into thinking they know what they're talking about. They don't. 
Now back in 84, you recall, there was a massive change if you're studying history. The National Party promised in 1990 to get rid of it. When they got in, they threw their manifesto in the rubbish bin and went down the same path, and we've had variations of the same ever since. And right now, they've come out with a brilliant idea that says we can't afford older people. <laughs> they say that you're going to live longer. Well, if you know anybody in the medical profession, I'll tell you that we've got a tsunami of medical conditions coming in this country, and the very idea that we're going to have an, old, uh, an aging population may well not be true. But whatever they're saying is only speculation. They don't know. But here's the truth. If we were to double our GDP in the next 33 years, then we could afford everything we've got now and much more. And is that difficult? I mean, 33 by 3 is way past doubling our economy. And when they say we can't afford the future, what they're really saying is we're so hopeless at running the economy, we've got no confidence in how well we'll do in the future. So you better start paying up now. And some of you are going to be leaving university, owing more money without a job than your parents with one. That wasn't the way it used to be, but it is the way it is now. Now don't get me wrong, anybody here, uh, because I know my, our opponents keep on saying we're anti-immigrant, and we're not. But you know of no population in the world voluntarily taking the numbers of immigrants that we are today. No country's voluntarily doing that. The British left the EU on the issue of immigration when it was running just over almost three times, four times less than ours is. A man called Trump with a strange haircut <laughs> won the impossible election when they said he couldn't and the number one issue was immigration and this country's economic health. And in Australia recently, a man called Turnbull called a snap election and when it was over he ended up with a hung political situation because the upper house was no longer remotely in their control. And it's here too. I come back to my point. What's going on in this country is we're bringing in 72,000 net. That's not gross, it's 128,000 gross. But 72,000 net, and it's a total lie to say they're returning New Zealanders from Australia. That's total bulldust. At least about only one in five is that one. They'll try and give you that excuse. And that's the population of Rotorua. Is anybody here from Rotorua? Well, let me tell you what that means. If you bring in the population of Rotorua every year, and they've been under labour, 50,000 plus now, 74,000, 72,000, net that is. If you bring in that population every year, then you've got to build that infrastructure every year. All the houses, all the hospitals, all the schools, all the crashes, you name everything that's in Rotorua, and that's what you'll have to build an infrastructure every year in this country. And they have been doing a fraction of it. So how are the rents here in Wellington? <laughs> Put your hand up if you're happy, but not if you're a landlord. Put your hand up if you're happy here. <laughs> well, you're happy with the rent. We live in the hut. <laughs> There's nobody perfect. <laughs> Be realistic. Look, you're being crowded out here. And just to make sure you can't compete against your fellow New Zealanders, they decided to load in a stack of people under <coughs> export education, excepting it's not export education anymore. <coughs> They've given them a work permit to compete with you for, against you for a job. Now before somebody gets soft in the heart and has a head to match and says, this guy is not a humanitarian, doesn't care about his population, I come from a family of 11 children. I know what poverty smells and tastes and feels like. I know what it's like to start life in a tent so we do know something about it, more than some of these people in Parliament, most of whom, who know so little about hard work and labour, they think the Prime Minister of uh, Mexico is manual labour. <laughs> <laughs> and it shows in their approach. They don't feel for the condition of people all, all around New Zealand. In Auckland, it's madness going on. They call it Generation Red. No, it's not. It's not having any regard to what young families will need to try and get a start on a ladder which used to be the story of New Zealand uniquely. One of the highest property-owned democracies in the whole wide world. We did all that, as I said. 
in a country the size of uh, the UK or Japan, every modern facility, railways, roads, bridges, you name it, and state housing and first start housing with a population the size of Manchester. Don't let some of these people tell you it can't be done. When they say that, have a good hard look at their economic philosophy and what they truly subscribe to. Now, can I just say this? The National Party started in 1893 under a name called Liberal and Splitton. In 1911, when four guys crossed the house to join the Reform Party, and in the end, they all got together in the 20s. Uh, by 19, uh, 1928 and the 30, 31, uh, they were within with the disaster of the uh, the Great Depression. The National Party was then a changed party, but it started in 1936. Labour started in 1916. And since that time, there has been a party called the Values Party, started in 1972, which is the modern day Greens. And then there was the Alliance, which started uh, in the early 90s. And then a new party turned up in 1993 called New Zealand First. And of all those parties, and all that time since 1893, the party that survived and is strongest now from that birth is New Zealand First. Now, I've got some friends from the media, the media here tonight who actually published polls. They're total crap, these polls. <laughs> just like they were in the UK. Just like they were when they, when they were saying that a guy called Trump had no chance to be the Republican candidate against 16 others, and he did. Then he was over 28% behind Clinton in the campaign, according to the pollsters. Total bulldust. When it was all over, they were wiped out. Same in Australia, and as I say, the same in New Zealand. We know the strength of this party, and it's rising, because so many people out there in New Zealand, when the pollsters call them, are not giving them an answer, for good reason. Because we have, in New Zealand, what they call the twin economy. There's Auckland, and then there's the rest of us. <laughs> Well, I remember John Key, the former Prime Minister, said this city was dying just two years ago, and he didn't know what to do about it. So welcome to the faculty, and welcome to Victoria and Milton University. And if you want to, have a, want to survive here, you better make up your mind whether there's a future here. Because there should be. It is, after all, the capital. This is the only capital I know in the whole world, in the whole wide world, that's dying. Namely Wellington. Now, the other point I want to make very, very clear to you is you've got a hard decision to make in the next few months, but for goodness sake, in the next <laughs> six months, and feel like voting. Mm -hmm. But if you're not on the floor, you won't be able to. Now, the second thing is some of you have a penchant for fads, for fadism, and temporary trends. Well, I'm a very, very, very small man, so are my colleagues. And if you feel in a moment of madness you don't have to vote for the Act Party, it's the National Party, or the Labour Party, or the Greens for that matter. Well, we'll be reasonable about that. But buy yourself some insurance. Give your second party vote to New Zealand first. Thank you very much. Any questions?